But if there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics, most golds rowdy by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Mark Davis looks like he's going to win it. And Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in U.S. history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to BreakoutSwimClinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best. BreakoutSwimClinic.com. Welcome, everybody, to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast Show. I'm Josh Davis, and I'm super excited about this week's guest. This person has guided numerous national and world champions uh, for over 20 years. Uh, you've produced dozens of Olympians uh, for the last five Olympiads, which is incredible, uh, for Team USA. And you've directed one of the most successful club teams of all time at Irvine Nova. And you are the head coach for the mighty USC Trojans for 12 years. And now you're the newest coach for the Tokyo Frogs. And uh, you're just one of the legendary producers of ultimate swimmers in, in swimming history. So please welcome to the show, Dave Stalo. Thanks for being on the show, Dave. Josh, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's, it's great to be thought of that well, and I've had a great career, and I uh, don't regret anything. It's been great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, we first met. Well, I don't know if we met. I'm going to go way back. We met on the 2000 team because you had produced, you had put several people on the 2000 team, uh, namely, you know, Aaron Pearsall. That's when I first got to see you, and and of course. Um, Amanda Beard was on 96 and 2000, but I remember you coaching, uh, coaching in 2000, Aaron Pearsall and us getting to hang out then, but I want to go back to 1990. I was a freshman at the University of Texas at Austin and the meet came down to the last relay between USC and Texas. And were you still on the staff at USC that year, that March? Uh, I was there. I uh, was just a graduate assistant working with Peter Dayland. Uh, I know we took second to Texas a couple of years in a row. Um, and um, But I, I, I was there. I, but I remember that. And, uh, but, but we had come from way, way down. I preceding that from 84 until, until the Olympic Games came to – LA in 84, the facilities at, at USC were pretty much uh, non-existent. The 84 games put the Olympic pool there on our campus, and there was a, a, a resurgence of USC swimming under Peter Dalen from that point um, to where we were back from. We were rivaling for the bottom end of the top 20 uh, for a few years there, and then, then the pool came, back, came in, and uh, we recruited some really great athletes, and I was fortunate to be part of Peter Devlin's uh, coaching staff. Yeah, that was a great rivalry uh, back in the late 80s. And uh, I remember Sean Jordan, the senior captain at Texas, came up to me bef before the 400 free relay. Because if we, if we won the relay, uh, we would win the meet. And it was a pretty good battle between us and, and you guys, USC. And he came up to me before the relay because I was leading off. I was only a freshman. And he just pulled me aside and said, don't screw this up. 
<laughs> and, and you guys were ahead most of that corner free relay, but Sean Jordan was in the zone and he dove sure. in and, and caught, I don't know if it was, it was Dave Wharton or somebody, but anyway, and caught him and we won the meet. But anyway, uh, I just, that was one of my first big memories was this Texas USC rivalry. And I always had great respect for USC. And one of the first Olympians I ever met was Dave Wharton. And I just thought the world of him, that this guy could be so tough, yet so nice at the same time, you know. And uh, so then Peter Dalen was was a, a legendary coach. And then I was so grateful because in 19, 1995 at World University Games, I broke the 200 free record leading off an 800 free relay. And he said, yeah, we'll make that count as the record, even though it wasn't in the individual event. Because it was a leadoff, we'll make that the World University Games record, and and he and he would lobbied for that and made that happen. So I had the record for a little bit, thanks to Peter Dalen. So that's my Peter Peter coach, uh, his coaching story. Um, so after USC, though, you go and you start taking over Irvine Nova, and you spend basically seventeen years building Nova into one of the top swim clubs in the world. And uh, but at the same time, you're it's a huge team. You're also running some college teams and putting people on the Olympic team. I mean, you, you must have been incredibly busy. Uh, well, I, I, as I tell everybody that, that I've been able to commit myself to swimming, uh, unlike a lot of other coaches, because I had nothing else in my life. I, I'm not married, I don't have kids, uh, lost my dog 14 years ago. So it's just been me against the world and the world of swimming. So I could commit myself to that, and that's what I committed myself through all those years. And, and I've always been a visionary type of a, of a coach in the sense that uh, when I took over Irvine Nova in 1990, I, I envisioned it was going to be one of the best teams in the country, and all the decisions that I would make um, administratively and athletically had to do with how could we be the best, either first off locally, then regionally, then the nationally, and to be honest with you, I, I didn't really understand. I always wanted to be an Olympic coach. I always wanted to be a coach. When I was in high school, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, being an Olympic coach, I didn't know what that really meant, uh, but that's what I wanted to be. Um, when I got to Irvine, I don't think I fully understood what my role was beyond the confines of Irvine Nova Aquatics. I was thinking just do the best I could for my athletes, but I attended a uh, United States Swimming Coaches Seminar one weekend sometime there, just in 92 or so, and, and I can't remember who was speaking, but they said our job as coaches in the club uh, area was to uh, was basically to field the, the Olympic team and take that responsibility beyond our own clubs and think in terms of the, the USA Swimming Club um, I came back and, and I, I was reinvigorated by that. And I told my athletes that uh, I think we're, our goal needs to be to put people on the Olympic team. And so that was back in 1993 or four. And I didn't have anybody really that was at that caliber at that point in time. But I, I told the athletes that we we're going to we're going to make decisions to that will enable us to put people on the Olympic team. And as I told the current group I had at the time, I said, it may not be any of you, but we've got to set the groundwork uh, for that to happen. And uh, Amanda Beard uh, made the Olympic team in, in 1996. This was the first athlete that I had. And uh, Steve West, who, who joined me from graduating from University of Michigan, he, he came and joined me for that year in preparation. He was third in the turn of breaststroke, just may, almost made the Olympic team. Right. Um, and uh, it was Jason Lisak's first Olympic trials. I think he finished dead last in the 100 free. Um, but we set a tone at that point forward that when I came back from the 1996 uh, experience, um, um, and I'll ask you, to take the, the, the sidebar to that is I was at a training camp in Colorado Springs with all the personal coaches, and and uh, one of the coaches on the on the on the a U.S. coaching staff, um, I had a 14-year-old kid on the team, and I was a little concerned that they didn't know how to uh, take care of a 14-year-old because we didn't have age group kids make the team at that point very much. Right. Um, and I, I, I stood up and said, this may never happen to me again, and I don't want you to screw it up. 
And uh, the coach came uh, up to me afterwards and said, don't act like that. You cannot envision that this is your first and only and last time that you're going to produce an athlete that will perform at the Olympic Games. So I really kind of changed my thinking quite a bit. Dramatically, I came back after the 96 experience and I told the team, we put one on the team. Our next goal four years from now will be four. And again, it was just a club team. Um, had not really uh, had a lot of postgraduates in my program at that point in time, but that was the stated goal. And I made that goal four years in advance. And when we put five people on the 2000 Olympic team, including Aaron Pearsall, um, uh, then I came back from 2000 and said, well, the goal now is six. Uh, by that time, I had so much credibility that everybody was uh, wanted to sign up uh, to, to be the next athlete to make the team. So, and that's kind of how my vision is that if you can establish yourself and, and uh, put, uh, put traction to your vision and it, 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 and it ends up happening, uh, then people start to believe you and start to embrace your, 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 your path towards those goals. So I, I think that's uh, what's carried me through to that kind of success. Yeah, that's great. Share, thanks for sharing that that story and that pro, that uh, progression in in your coaching vision. Um, I think of you a lot because you you're one of the first gurus of race pace. Other people get credit for being race based experts, but in my opinion, you're the first. And. When I tell people my coaching philosophy of my college team, uh, this is the analogy I use, and I want I want you to give me your opinion on it. I say that in coaching, the coaching philosophies, there's two ends of the spectrum. There's old school, you know, 10,000 meters, no time for technique or cheering, just chase that black line and get in the yardage. And then there's new school, epitomized by Michael Andrew, just 25s, and you know, good for him. He's got a hundred age group records. That's cool. And then there's a lot in the middle. And I think the ideally in the middle is what I call the healthy hybrid. The healthy hybrid has some traditional things, has some long things, has equipment things, kicking things, but it also has a lot of race pace things. And to me, whenever I saw your workouts or saw your athlete, they, they had a great healthy hybrid a great mixture of both a lot of race based stuff, but, uh, never, you know, never shying away from, from technique things and drill things and equipment things and tough things. And, uh, so I just, I just really feel like you really mastered the healthy hybrid. And that's what I try and do with my team. Would you, would you say that's kind of a, a safe analysis of what you've tried to do? Well, I think uh, as, as you well understand that, that most of us as coaches, really, we as we go into coaching, we just uh, our 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 methodology is based on what we we experience as athletes. And so, I coached when I started coaching. I was twenty years, just turning twenty, had a small team uh, that had never experienced much uh, much of anything and kind of experience at all, performance wise or training wise, and. I went in with the mentality that we were going to be a very traditional program. We we're going to we we're going to slam nine thousand yards per practice, and and um, that was my eager youthfulness, not really knowing what I was doing, other than based on my experience. And I was miserable for my first four years of coaching because they were miserable, I was miserable. They, we weren't getting a whole lot of result. Um, what changed my course of action really was a professor that I studied with at Long Beach State named, named Joseph Mastropolo. And I was taking exercise physiology. That was my master, my, my degree effort. And um, he really taught me, opened up my mind to uh, training for race speed, for uh, power, for velocity, and, and really uh, challenged my, my conventional thinking about how you train for uh, for any kind of athletic performance, in particular swimming. Uh, so I embraced those ideas because he showed me in, in, in the lab situation what that result was when you focus more on velocity-based training versus volume training. Um, gave me a chance as a, as a young student, really, to challenge um, my theories about training. So I, not a lot of people know this, but I took the 
took that rate, the velocity based training concept into personalizing it. And I, I trained myself for master swimming. I swam faster as a master swimmer than, than I did uh, swimming in college with, with John Urbanchek, who's a great coach. Um, yeah. But I actually swam faster two years removed from John when I incorporated velocity based training or race pace training in a very limited period of time. I was going faster over 200 IM, 400 IM, 200 breaststroke, et cetera. I also challenged myself in, uh, to train for marathon running marathon and doing just velocity-based training. And I uh, did that for a period of 11, 12 weeks and did nothing over 45 minutes per session, all faster than what I intended to race at. And I went three hours and 25 minutes for a marathon. Wow. Uh, so, and I trained in the laboratory uh, for uh, triathlons where I did nothing but train in the lab, uh, use velocity-based training on, on mechanisms like stationary ergometers and stationary arm ergometers and swimming in the pool and, and was able to be pretty successful uh, for me um, doing those things using a very completely different philosophy. So once I better understand, I, I, I got my master's degree at Long Beach State, went on to USC to study uh, for my PhD and just really challenged the concept of tra traditional training and, 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 and as I embraced more of the understanding the science of exercise physiology, better understand the biochemistry of it all. Um, I just became more and more convinced that uh, you could train with a velocity-based uh, focus and not so much on a yardage focus and be more focused on technique and, and, and those types of things. And just embracing what you know about uh, swimming at race speeds and uh, Somebody just asked me this. I got an email the other day from a coach who he was trying to incorporate my philosophy with his kids, but the kids couldn't understand why they didn't do hundreds. They would do repeat 75s. And the coach wanted a better explanation. I said, well, you can't repeat hundreds at your race goal pace. Yeah. But 75s, you got a chance of holding that race pace. Or 325s with six seconds rest per 25, you can probably more likely hold – those 25s consistently faster than race pace. And then I explained to him that uh, mechanically um, drag forces increase exponentially as you increase velocity uh, linearly. So what you're trying to do is learn to overcome drag forces that you're not going to overcome if you're going sub max level of, of, of effort. There's a lot of other biochemistry and physiologic uh, adaptations that occur with race pace or velocity based training. And so I've embraced it. The other thing I've embraced is the idea that swimming is really um, uh, a boring sport. It's, it's, it's boring as hell to train. It, it's, it's, it's not a lot of fun. It's very arduous. I love the sport. Um, and so I've kind of embraced the idea if I can make swimming more interesting, relevant to a kid as they're uh, train when I was I was a backstroker, breaststroker, and every year we have to swim the fifteen hundred free, and we do one hundred seventy fives on a minute and repeat. I'm like this. I don't swim this. I don't. I'm not trying to trying to go the English Channel. Why am I? And I didn't know the answers. I didn't. I thought I had a great respect for my my club coach, and we just did what we were told to do, and that's why I eventually coached the way he did. Eventually. To, to initiate my career. Um, but then when I just threw away that concept and embraced more race pace, velocity based, um, understand the physiology and the biochemistry, I could really create uh, an innovative uh, framework for training that doesn't always have to look like swimming. I, again, I got a text message from a friend today and she asked me to, re to remind her how I, how I do my triangle sets. Yeah. And tri yeah, triangle set, uh, just for your uh, listeners, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's really simple. You can you can do it in all kinds of different ways. But the way I look at it visually is that I'm kicking, having the kids kick against kicking against the wall as fast as they can, holding great body position for ten seconds, and then I signal them to go. They do a flip turn, they angle downward with good control their body cord, kicking down towards the bottom, usually about 10, 15 feet. Uh, deep or 10 feet deep out from the wall, about 15, 20 feet. Then they do, they do a flip turn at the bottom, come straight up, working on streamlined body posture, kicking, 
Um, then they come to the top, do a flip turn to the horizontal, and then they swim as full speed as they can coming back to the wall. And so in traditional sense, you're like, well, how do you, how do you write that in a set? How many yards is that? It's like, well, it doesn't matter how far it is. What it is is you're kicking against the wall. You're working. That's kind of resistance set. You're working kicking. You're working posture. Maybe you have them hold their breath during that 10 seconds. So your breath control work, you're doing flip turns against the wall. So that's a skill working against the resistance of the water as you go downward, doing a flip turn on the bottom. Again, it's a resistance type activity. So you're really working the core. And then you've got to come out of that with good posture. Well, those are all mechanical things. The heart rate's really highly elevated. You keep them going really quick. They're coming into the wall. So they're working on that fast finish component uh, that you want to kind of create as a habit. And um, you do that for, for 15, 20 minutes worth of work. And the kids don't even realize that they've done a ton, a ton amount of work, but it's not just swimming back and forth and back and forth. Right. And, and so, so I, I try to, I, I'm always, I think I, I continue to explore different ways to um, kind of challenge the physiology, at the same time challenging the brain uh, to overcome the discomfort of training. Because uh, I just think going to re repeat back and forth, as you say, ch chasing the black line, it's really, really pretty boring. I wanted to take a moment from this fascinating interview to let you know about a new partner for the Ultimate Swimmer podcast, and that is Swimshare. Swimshare is a free workout riding tool. Just Google Swimshare, all one word, Swimshare. And you can put in today's workout in just a few clicks, and it sends and stores all your workouts within seconds. The first workout you'll see on there is one of my favorites from yours truly. Check out Swimshare and take your workouts to the next level. Send, store, and share your swimming masterpieces with Swimshare. I remember you know, watching Aaron Pearsall train at the 2000 camp. I can't, I think we were already in, in Sydney or maybe it was Brisbane. I think we were in Brisbane in our, our training camp right before we moved into the Sydney Olympic village and Aaron was doing some 75s. Uh, I don't know if it was 15 or 20 or a bunch of them, but he was just holding a monster pace and he, you could just tell it was burning, but you know, but he was able to hold that repetition. And I thought, wow, this, this kid's really good. And sure enough, he gets second to Lenny at, at the, get the silver medal at his first Olympics. And he was, you know, 17 years old. And I thought, okay, y'all are doing something, even in these short little reps, you know, that's making someone fast and fit at the same time. You're getting strength and speed and endurance at the same time. And, uh, it, you know, years later, of course, I was able to kind of explore, like you said, I explored on myself these race pace concepts mm -hmm. uh, because, I, you know, I was in Eddie's formula for a long, long time and it worked. I made uh, two Olympics with Eddie and then in ultimately his brother, Randy Reese. Um, and I look back and a lot of the good stuff I did with Eddie and Randy was some race pace hybrid stuff, you know, that really did help. It's just kind of longer <laughs> race pace stuff. So, but, um, but I, I want to, I want to just, uh, just acknowledge how the spectrum of people you've put on the Olympic team from 50 freestylers to milers. And I'm going to say a name of some of your Olympians. And I want you to say in response a word or a phrase of what they did well that young people listening to this podcast can apply and emulate in their swimming journey. So, so it, it might be a little difficult to put it in one word or one phrase, but we'll just give it a go. Okay. You're challenging my memory. Thanks. Okay. So, so we'll just start Amanda Beard four Olympics. What comes to mind when you think of Amanda, what she did well that we could apply? Um, well, yeah, just she was part of that group that I had that, that I think they feared me to the extent that they just did what I told them to do. <laughs> um, but she was really, really coachable, uh, extremely coachable. I, uh, my first experience with her at a national championship, I mean, she one year she'd come off of winning the Western Zone Championship. The following year she was coming, uh, she was finishing third at the at, uh, nationals and 
to their breaststroke. And it was her first nationals. She was 14 years, 13 years old. And I took her to the pool early for finals. And I noted to her exactly where I wanted her to pick up her tempo with about 65 meters to go. And a lot of us as coaches, we, we give that instruction to our athletes, but we don't always see it. And so that night when she came, when she got to that 65 meter mark uh, left to go, she was probably in sixth place. And she did exactly what I asked her to do. She picked up the tempo and kept that tempo going. It was the tempo that most people are familiar with in her career that, man, she just picked, picks it up and gets going. So extremely coachable, I think sometimes out of fear, but I'm, I wasn't a scary guy, but I think she was so young and it was happening so fast that she, she was just afraid to screw up and she never screwed up. She was, she was awesome. I enjoyed working with her. Yeah. She and I did a clinic last year together in uh, Illinois and it was so cool to hear her stories and, you know, kind of from her, per, her perspective now looking back on her career, but to hear her advice, to hear her stories, to hear her journey is, is so cool because, you know, like when we were on the team together, I was 23, she was 14, you know, so that's always my memory of Amanda was being 14. But uh, so um, Aaron Pearsall, anything come to mind with Aaron? Uh, and always great positive attitude. Uh, there was never a, a workout that was too hard. It was always willing to challenge himself. He, he really thrived on whatever the challenge might be. Uh, I did, I tell people this, that, that most of my workouts are, are com kind of pro uh, comprised of odd number of repetitions. So it's five rounds of 325 plus a 50 or something like that. And I always say that the odd round, that first round was the Aaron Pearsall round because he never got it right. So I always had to build, build in a first round of something because I would always have to stop the kids because Aaron never got it right. Um, I don't know if he was just uh, pulling my chain or he was just, uh, just, he was just ready to chomp at the bit to do the work that we needed to do. But uh, just great positive attitude. Never, never, never had a bad attitude. Always was a good attitude. When we trained at Texas for about three or four years together, he was the toughest training partner I ever had. Of all the guys I raced with my 14 years, no one was as tough and as consistent as Pearsall. He was the best training partner. So I, I appreciate him. I actually, I don't know if you remember this, but I got to be next to him in his first world record. That's what I remember. So I, I like to joke, I pushed him for the start. I was with him for about 10 meters. Yeah. So if it wasn't for me, he might not have gotten that record. I mean, I was really close to him for the first 15 meters. Well, it's funny. That story was great because he had such a uh, – I had a great team at that meet. We won the meet. But uh, the day of the 200 backstroke in the morning, he had such a beautiful swim, well well paced, and very much in control. That And I had a team meeting with the kids before we went to the pool for the finals. And I, I said, be, be on the deck during the 200 backstroke. I think we're going to see something special. And I didn't say we're going to see a world record. I just said, we're going to see something special. So he walks out for the finals. And, and Aaron, as you well know, is extremely sociable. Um, and uh, he's just kind of walking out in, in, in an air of, uh, I don't know, air of enlightenment that he's getting ready to swim. And he puts his cap on. He put it on backwards. And the team is freaking out that his cap was inside out. I said, leave him alone. Just, just leave him alone. It's okay. Um, but I was, I was, I was probably, as you know, my, my career has been challenged by the voices of dissent that uh, what we're doing was the wrong thing, that you, you couldn't train for a 200 backstroke or whatever event and be very successful doing sprint training. And, and uh, he came off that 150 mark, and I, just, I know you were there. I remember that so distinctly. Um, and he just lit on fire that last 50 at the fastest last 50 ever in the, in that event and broke the world record. And, and I, I think he left you in the dust by about five seconds. I think <laughs> I was, <laughs> you were ahead the rest of the field. I was two double O. So, so he was way ahead of me. And this third place was like two Oh three, two Oh four. So I was looking good for silver place, but Aaron was just yeah. way, I don't, I mean, he was, Everybody else was way off camera, yeah. but it was, uh, we were so happy for him. And uh, so that's a, a credit to you guys. Um, let's see here. Of course, Jason Lezak. 
Well, I think uh, a, a um, relationship uh, that we had started out like a lot of coaches and swimmers, it was very, very rough uh, in his early days as a high school kid. Well, I started coaching him when he was about 15. Um, and he, I don't think he appreciated me and, and, and um, it wasn't, it was, it was tough for the first couple of years. He started to really appreciate me and my philosophies uh, when he got kicked off his high school, his college, uh, college team. And um, he started to appreciate my workouts a little bit more after a couple of years of college coaching. Uh, so, uh, but we developed a great relationship, a very, very strong working relationship. And as I learned better to understand him, it was, I had to, uh, approach him every season with a new, new kind of concept to embrace that we couldn't do, do 10 things all at once. It had to be a couple of things each season. Um, I think that's why he's had, had such a long sustaining career so that we didn't just try to pound it all in in one, on, in one slot. So, uh, once we kind of got that relationship going, that that he knew that my whole concern was his de- his development as an athlete that was uh, trying to put him in the best position to be the best he could be. I think that relationship worked really really well for each other. That uh, uh, there were times it was a little iffy. It, he quit on me one time, and and, and uh, that was a funny story. We were, we were doing some set he didn't like. And he he gets out and said, "I quit." He asked some of the other guys to join him, and, and he was gone for about two or three days. And one of his teammates says, Dave, you got to go over and see him. I said, he knows where I am. He can come back if he wants to come back. I, I, I'm not, I didn't take it personally. He was frustrated because I was challenging him a little bit. And so he wouldn't come back, so I had to go over to his house. We, we had a really good talk, and, and uh, we just worked things out. It was, But it was a perfect coach-swimmer relationship. It's not always perfect. It's sometimes it's strained. Um, but we learned how to get the best out of each other. And, and uh, I'm just so proud of the fact that he had such a long career and, and uh, was very successful and um, saved Michael Phelps' ass for uh, those, those that extra medal. So, <laughs> totally. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah, it was a challenge, but it was one that we, we, we saw through that, the difficulties that we could help each other out, which I think I'm really proud of the fact that we can both do that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, he was on the relays with me in 2000 and then 2004, he had some, some great ups and downs and um, obviously shown real bright in 2008 anchoring the relay, but you know, a credit to you because you know, he was on his own for a few years leading into 2008 because you had gone to USC. So a year or two, he was, he was taking what he had learned from you and having to apply it by himself, you know, which is difficult, but, but it's a credit for what you instilled in him. So, so well done. Thank you. Uh, real quick, another great sprinter, Gabe Woodward. <laughs> Gabe, I think was the, uh, just, he was another one of those guys who were very, very positive. I think he was just, uh, holding on to the, 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 the coattails of Jason. I had a really good group of, of sprinters the year that uh, Gabe made the team. Um, and uh, he just, he was, he was just all in. He was all in and, and it was a big surprise for everybody for him to make the team, uh, made the relay. Um, but uh, again, he was a really good technician. Uh, I think he, he was, he got the opportunity to train, you know, in a manner that was probably more conducive for him to be successful because he, he came out of training with a small club in Bakersfield and jumped right into uh, uh, Coach Schubert at USC, which is a very, very different model of training. And then he got to train with me and a group of really, really good sprinters at the time that included Jason and Scott Tucker and, and uh, uh, Brad Shoemaker. And we had, we had a bunch of guys that, that all met that year that, uh, that uh, I think created a great atmosphere for some good training. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I want to switch over to the other side of things. Uh, Larson Jensen and then Us, Us Malui, uh, two of some of my favorite distance swimmers of all time. Um, just this, those guys are so tough. Yeah. So what, t- tell us about what your thoughts about Larson. Well, Larson, I, Larson was in his senior year at USC when I got there. And, and um, Larson and I had a great relationship. He was willing to do whatever I asked of him. 
He also sat, found that uh, any time that he wanted something that was maybe different from what I might uh, pr- uh, put together in a workout, I, I was willing to do that. So there are occasions where he'd come in and say, Coach, I want to go 16400s. And I'll say, okay, well, let, let me put that together. Let me make sure we got a couple guys to do it with you. And, and I'll put my spin on it, uh, get some guys to do it with you, and, and we'll, we'll go at it. But for the most part, 90% of the time, he was very, very uh, willing to do what I asked him to do. He had no, no reason to, to believe in me or trust me, but he did. Um, and um, I, our goal that year, his last year, was to get him through a really good NC2A championships. And then his plan was to go back to Mission Viejo and train with Bill Rose uh, for the Olympics that year. Uh, at first, he was thinking about not even going to the Olympics, but... Later on, he, he, I think he had such a good NC to a season that year that um, uh, he decided to keep going for the Olympics. But as you, as you recall, going into um, – that was my first year coaching at USC, and, and he's right. our best swimmer in terms of performance-wise. And uh, he, he won the 500 free the, the first night at NC to A's. And I had a lot of people coming up to me and asking me who my uh, distance coach was, and I – I took, offense. I took offense to that. I said, damn it, I, I, I'm the distance coach. I coach everybody. And, and I go, whoa, that was really cool. That Larson won the 500 free. And then two days later, he won the 1650 free by, by a long sled and um, just missed uh, breaking the American record by a couple hundredths of a second. And, and then it was then, then the questions were, well, how did you, how did you, what did you do? How did you coach him? How did you, Get him to go that fast. I said, "Well, I, I taught him to sprint the mile. That's that's the way we do it." Yeah. So um, there was he, he, Larson is by far probably. Uh, I got some great athletes, but Larson's probably the toughest, just just the toughest male athlete I've ever had. Haley Anderson is the toughest female athlete I've ever yeah. had. Uh, just they're just the tough and. You know, when he went to the Olympic trials, uh, he went to he swam. He went to Mission Viejo to, to train for trials with Bill Rose. I, I got and I said good luck, goodbye. I'm glad we had a great season together. And he called me back up and two weeks later, and he said, ah, you know what? I think I want to come back and train with you for trials. I said, okay, that's great. Um, so uh, he did. He, he joined me, trusted in what what I had to offer as his coach. And uh, but I'll tell you that. that, that the thing that was the coolest thing is he came up to me before the uh, 400 free finals and tr- trials that year. And he said, coach at 200, I'm just, I'm just lighting it up. I'm going. If anybody wants to go with me, how at it, but I'm going. And I think you've done that before in the 200. Field. I think I remember seeing you do that. Yeah. So I, I just said, okay, well go get him." And sure enough, he took off and, and just never looked back and, and won the 400 freestyle and, Later made this made the fifteen hundred free as well. So um, Ose, uh, Ose was a little bit different, different story. He was a post grad when I got to USC, and, and um, he was kind of hit and missing practice and coming in, going, and he was gone for a lot, and come in for a couple of days, and then one day he was about ready to get in the water, and I, I said I said stop, and he goes what? I said stop, you can't swim here anymore. And he, what, what do you mean I can't swim here anymore? I said, you can't swim here anymore. If, if, if you, you're done with your college eligibility, um, if you want to train here with me, with Trojan Swim Club, I would love to coach you. You're a great athlete, but you have to do what I tell you to do. you got to come in and do what I ask you to do. You just have to trust me. And, and he looks at me and he goes, you're serious. I said, yes, I'm serious. You can't train here unless you train the way I want you to be training. So, he kind of relented because he didn't want to leave LA and, and uh, gave me full reign to train him. And uh, we train him uh, velocity based training for a miler, not for a 50 guy, but for a yeah. miler. And, uh, we had a great run together through 2008 and 2012. And, and um, he came away with a couple gold medals in the, in the distance events, which I like to call, I call long sprint. <laughs> Well, 15 minutes is, is a sprint relative to yeah. other. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's um, real quick, just a couple more. Uh, Rebecca Stoney and Lenny Kraselberg. Yeah, Lenny, Lenny Kraselberg will uh, do anything to be the best that he could. And 
uh, I was fortunate. I, uh, Josh, I've coached a lot of athletes at the end of their careers. They, they, they kind of uh, wake up late in their careers and go, I'm going to go train with Coach Salem and see what happens. I wish they come a little earlier. But uh, many came to me. I was coaching Irvine Nova at the time, and, and uh, Aaron had uh, been developing and, and obviously was a silver medalist in 2000. Uh, Olympic Games and Lenny getting ready for the 2004 had suffered. He was into his third or second labral tear and knee problems, and he was having all kinds of problems. And he didn't really think that the the usual bent on his uh, on his training was going to really get him through. He thought he just wasn't going to be able to handle that kind of work. So came down to train with me, and he was just such a perfectionist that he's always been that way. He's uh, uh, he, he, a good example is we would do these sets where we'd, we would start at the flags and you'd have to go in and out as fast as you can through the turn. And he would literally try to figure out where his arm should be related to his first stroke. Yeah. And I would watch him with curiosity. It's like, what is he doing? Just swim. But he was trying to find what was the best way uh, to get to the wall the fastest. I, I remember him telling a story um, I think it was it was uh, NC Tways who got beat by Neil Walker, in the yeah. 200 backstroke or 100 backstroke, I think it was. And he comes back and says how he was he was kind of mesmerized, but how how good Neil was off the wall. And so Lenny came back and he really committed himself to being better off the wall. So um, he's just a perfectionist, and, and whatever you asked him to do, uh, he would he would do it. Um, about a couple months before Olympic trials in 2004, he'd been having this nag- nagging shoulder problem. And, and I, I said, how are you feeling? He goes, it doesn't really matter, does it? Said, You're right. It doesn't matter. So let's get going. So um, this is a great friend of mine. And, and uh, he, 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 he didn't have as great a finish to his career as he would have liked, but he overcame so many injuries and, and uh, problems that, that year, uh, made the Olympic team, uh, was on the relay that won the gold medal uh, as, a, as a backup. Uh, he was fourth, I think, in the 100 backstroke. Uh, 200 back wasn't quite there. He just didn't have the, the strength for it anymore. But uh, just, a, just a great career athlete that, uh, unfortunately, I've been fortunate to, to, to work with. Uh, Rebecca, Sonia, Rebecca and Sonia and I had was kind of uh, reminiscent of, of Jason. Uh, very difficult at the beginning. Uh, my first year with USC, and we were doing a long course workout. First month I was there, and and uh, we, uh, she she comes up and she's swimming breaststroke, and I'm at the end of the pool, and she stops and she goes, "I hate your workouts and I hate your drills." I'm like. Oh my God, my best swimmer does not like me. And um, this is her, her, her sophomore year. And, uh, yeah. and I'm, I'm in, in my mind, as a college coach, I'm like, oh my God, she's going to quit. She's going to transfer. She's going to And, I, and I, I never would do this, but I did this with her. I pulled her aside and I said, Rebecca, I've had a lot of success with breaststroke swimmers. You've got to give me that. And I'm not going to change your stroke because your stroke is very, very different. Uh, I will come to understand your stroke. I will come to understand the weaknesses and strengths of your stroke. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go from there. You've got to, again, you've got to trust me and, uh, and, and, and you'll be okay. Well, it, was, it took her a full year to really gain that trust because she, she was fortunate to be invited to a long course meet in Australia at the end of um, her sophomore year long course, which we hadn't done any training. And she finished second um, in the Turner breaststroke uh, behind um, Liesl Jones from Australia, who's the reigning queen of breaststroke. And she came back from that experience going, wow, I, 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 maybe Dave's okay. So we had a long uh, relationship together and um, I just uh, always willing to work hard. Uh, I think I understood her stroke well and understood her and, and uh, yeah, we, we, you know, it was uh, sometimes challenging with her because she was such a perfectionist. She wanted to, to do well, and um, uh, but I think we had a great run at it. And, and, and I, I just uh, she's one of the one of my favorite people of all time. We had a great time last year. 
you and Rebecca Sony and I and Aaron Pierthal, we got to teach in Mexico for a few days. Yes. Uh, and we had a blast because, you know, it was fun to watch you and Rebecca and Aaron catch up on old stories. And uh, obviously it's fun to, to teach and share our stories with our friends in Mexico and the kids in Mexico and eat their food. It was just, just yeah. a great weekend. So I, I could just see the, uh, just the thankfulness they had for you and, you know, the ups and downs y'all share that made the, you know, the, the bond, the friendship that much more special. I want to take a quick break from this super fun interview to tell you about an awesome new resistance tool I found at gmx7training.com. Swimming with the GMX7 training resistance system allows me and my swimmers to not just go 25s, but 50s and beyond. GMX7 training allows you to get strength gains faster, engage the core more, feel the catch of the water better, and get more work done in less time. gmx7training.com. Don't just get strong, get swimming strong. Check it out at gmx7training.com. Well, one, one last athlete I wanted to ask about, uh, Vlad Morozov. I mean, this guy can fly. Yeah. And, uh, what, what, was, what is unique about him that a current athlete could apply to their career? Uh, well, he's uh, – <laughs> Vlad is a funny kid. He's, he's originally from Russia, and he still has that kind of – that Russian, um, I would call it Russian stoicism. That uh, when I was coaching him in college, I would I would say, hey, hey, hey Vlad, how about nineteen eight on this fifty coming up against uh, against uh, Cal? And he'd look at me with that stoicism, and he go nineteen seven. It's like oh, okay, nineteen seven, it's good, and he'd go nineteen seven. So we've always had that relationship. I would I would throw something out at him. Uh, as, a, as kind of a time as a, as a goal, and he'd always he would always up me by one. Um, he's he's he's, uh, he's still training with me now, and uh, we've had a great conversation about his preparation for uh, this upcoming Olympics uh, in Tokyo. And uh, we're trying. But he's he's always a really thoughtful uh, thinker about the swimming and the stroke. And we don't always we don't agree necessarily. But it always sets up a dialogue about, I think one thing, he thinks another thing. I think 1980, he thinks 1970. Uh, I think the first 15 meters of the of the race is not as important as the last 15 meters. So we have to have that conversation and dialogue about it so that he understands my point of view and I understand his point of view. So he's very thoughtful um, and but is, he's very stoic uh, in, the, in the Russian mode, um, but tremendously talented and, uh, he's, he's, he's been he's been fun to work with. He's he's always very complimentary. When he likes my workouts, he tells me he likes my workout. And that always is as coaches, we don't get that very often. So when he right. gets out and says, Good workout, coach. It's like that's a good workout. So yeah. I thank you. That is nice. I t- I tell all the kids I get to work with at the clinics, I says, You should thank your coach for every practice, especially the hard ones. You know, yeah. it's time to prepare and plan and open up the pool for you. You should thank them every time. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm assuming you had a blast at the ISL, the six-week Budapest second season. You're the new coach at Tokyo. Can you just give us a quick synopsis of your time there, some of the athletes you got to work with, any kind of cool behind-the-scenes stories? Well, I swear, I if I could have stayed another week or two, I would have. Um, uh, first off, I think with uh, uh, constantly Kim Gregorshin and Katinka Hoge, you did to make sh- make the bubble in, in Budapest happen was incredible. Um, uh, Katinka, who I coached at USC, um, she did a yeoman's job of, of getting politicians to change laws and to get this thing there. And, and it, it really created an opportunity for athletes of that caliber to train uh, without interruption and to compete on a regular basis. And those that went and participated got a huge, huge uh, surge in what they're doing in prepara- preparation for Tokyo. So it was just incredible. Um, our situation with, with Japan was interesting. The majority of the team was from Japan, and um, it was a format for them that we all thought would be just so different for them that we weren't sure they would uh, really uh, kind of embrace it. Um, my f- first job was really to kind of inculcate the, the team concept because it's it's very foreign for 
uh, Japanese swimmers to really kind of appreciate that, the kind of like that collegiate uh, air of, uh, of competition. So that was our first task. So I, I had to, I taught them the, the frog cheer. That was my first thing is the frog cheer. And if you watch the meet, you'd see them come out, they do this whole hop thing. And that was part of our, our kind of our, that was our shtick. And yeah. it was cool to watch them embrace that. Um, and we had some great athletes from Japan. They're just, they were very resilient. And <laughs> those guys are training in the weight room and in the pool very diligently all the way through. And there were, there were times I was surprised that uh, we'd finish a competition match and some of them would be over in the weight room working out afterwards. So very, very serious. And the coaching staff was outstanding. Um, um, uh, it was, it was, it was, uh, like I said, I just, we, we, we trained our group a little bit more like a team. Um, so it, we ran uh, prepared practices every day for every everybody who was part of the, the training. Uh, I would run the first part of practice and we'd break out into three different groups. Uh, yeah. We only had one swimmer, uh, Bruno Fraudus, whose coach was there, who is kind of independent of the, the rest of the team. But for the most part, the whole team trained together, which was very unique and different for, for our team. So uh, if, it, as, if the dynamic of the team changes where it's uh, more half and half Japanese and international athletes, the format of what it might look like will change uh, the, the training protocol. But it was really fun to get a chance to work with some of these just Japanese kids are disciplined. And I, I love the Japanese kids because after practice, they all stand up and they, they uh, respectfully uh, bow and acknowledge their coaches and they bow and acknowledge the facility, the pool. And, and uh, we had a great time and we, some spoke English pretty well. And some, I, I, I took me four weeks to pretty much identify everybody by name and event. Um, uh, coaches were really serious. Uh, the athletes were, were, I swear to God, these athletes would probably stretch hour and a half before every, I didn't even see half the stretching they were doing, but they would stretch before a match for an hour and a half to two hours. They're just constantly stretching. Wow. Uh, very, very good at skills. And so in talking with the coaches, they, they, they're really good about developing school uh, skills as age groupers. Yeah. Um, if you look at um, just the, uh, just, 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 just the technique is so, so good. So, so that's, uh, but it, it's a great, it was a great vehicle for some great training and, and competition. I'm, I'm just very really fortunate to be part of it. I feel that everybody went there, the athletes and the coaches. That was probably the most productive six weeks you could have leading into an Olympic year with all the training and racing and massages and good food and good encouragement and good, you know, just sharing ideas and building, like you said, building that team concept and just having a, you know, an appreciation for all these other swimmers. I think it's going to be exciting when they do get to the Olympics. They have just 300 new friends, you know, old yeah. friends, 300 old friends. Yeah. yeah. I think it's cool. And, uh, the, you know, Japanese aren't the biggest athletes, so they have to have that perfect technique, that perfect skill, you know, so that's, I think that's encouraging for us to apply to. Um, well, what do you, uh, what's your schedule like leading up for the, the next uh, several months? You're just coaching a handful of pros and then kind of getting ready for the next ISL season after that. Yeah, I, I uh, when I left USC to go into semi-retirement, I, I kind of told everybody that I was uh, would take on projects. I wasn't going to uh, embrace too much. I wasn't going to look for another job. I've been with Irvine Nova for for thirty odd years as coach or general manager. Um, so when I came back down to Irvine, I had a number of the kids that were training with me with Trojan Swim Club say, "Well, when do we start?" And I said, "Well, okay, let's start." So we have a number of kids who moved down to Orange County. We've got some that are traveling uh, from L.A. County back down here. So I've got a group training group uh, training uh, once a day, every day, uh, Sunday through Friday. And we take Saturday off. Um, and that's 8 to 10 in the morning. And the rest of my day is, is committed to me and whatever else I'm, I'm doing. I'm renovating my house, so I'm still working on that. Um, I pop in and uh, I'm kind of a substitute coach for some of the age group coaches when they can't be there at practice. So I come in and do that. 
Um, I've committed to be uh, a former swimmer of mine who's the head coach at uh, Orange Coast College. I've committed to being his uh, assistant coach this season if we have a season, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and ISL, as they begin plans for that, I'm, I'm eager to be a part of the Tokyo Frog Kings as my, my gig. And um, we'll see how things go from there. I, I, I plan on eventually getting Sailor Swim Camp back up and going and uh, kind of putting it on the road. Um, I'd like to do three, four day camps like I did at USC, but kind of going on the road. I've got some great contacts in China and Japan that I'd like to take advantage of. And um, I love teaching. I love to, to coach and teach. And um, uh, I want to do a little bit better job of mentoring my coaches at, at Irvine Nova, so we got plans for that as well. So a little bit of a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But I'm, I'm taking more time for me. So i yeah. in the last two months I've lost 25 pounds. I got 15 more to go and working out a little bit, started swimming a little bit. Um, so I, I'm in, I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I'm having a great time. I, I don't miss NC2 uh, athletics at all. <laughs> Well, it sounds like a perfect retirement where you're productive and still helping young kids become ultimate swimmers, uh, but still having that balance for you. You've, yeah. you've earned it. You deserve it. And uh, But thanks for all you've done uh, for so many ultimate swimmers, especially those on Team USA. And uh, thanks for our friendship. And I can't wait to work with you at a pool soon. Good. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Good luck. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. So we did it. That's perfect. Right. Sounds good. Is, is well, that broadcast live or are you cut uh, it off? My, my uh, assistant coach, Noah, he's my technique or technical guru. He knows all the ins and outs. So he takes this recording and he can put pieces of it on YouTube and he can put the whole thing on the nice part on podcast. Oh, and cool. So people will just hear the audio on the podcast. Good. Cool. Well, good. Well, thanks. So, around noon. Okay. Are you still coaching then? What are you yeah, doing our, our season's been pretty normal. We yeah. have uh, two more meets, January 15th and January 23rd. You know, January 15th is our last dual meet against OBU, Sam Free's old team. And they just, just canceled it last month. That's what I heard. Why did yeah. they cancel? I guess the AD and the president just had a funky interpretation, like most of these deals. They mm -hmm. have 50 swimmers, 50 paying swimmers. It more than covers, it more than triples their budget. And I don't know why they're canceling it. It makes no sense. Too bad, too bad. Well, good. Well, good luck for the season and uh, we'll see you when we see you. Yeah. Thanks again for your time. Take care. All right. You take care. Bye-bye. I want to take a moment to tell you about my favorite swim cap, the Hammerhead swim cap. It's the safest, fastest, longest lasting, most comfortable swim cap in the world. It's one-of-a-kind patented honeycomb shock-absorbing technology will prevent concussions. And the hammerhead cap has no wrinkles to ensure top speed with the least resistance. And it's super comfortable. That's easy to get on and easy to get off. And it will never tear. This is the last cap you will ever need to buy. Safety and speed, all at hammerheadswimcaps.com. Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey, and they can help you too. If there is an Ultimate Swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at joshdavis.com. And tell us about how your Ultimate Swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.